I've been here before visiting people and it's a, just such a lovely atmosphere. And I know that your philosophy is very much similar to our own over in uh, FCS. And it's very much a bottom up rather than top down approach to life. Um, anyway, yes, so Samhain is this, the Samhain is, is that that's called, it's, it's Irish word for Halloween, which is today, of course, and I'm really, really, really like Halloween, so I'm very delighted to be able to speak about all sorts of things on, at Halloween. So I start off with Halloween, and, um, or Samhain, so where it comes from, it comes from Ireland, actually, and um, the date of it is, well, there, when the earth is there relative to the sun, like there, halfway between the autumnal equinox and the uh, winter solstice. And that's uh, pretty much, um, I mean, just this, when the Earth is around here, of course, the sunny time of the year, and it's the bright time, and our, that sort of thing. Uh, this side is the dark side, and so Halloween, or Samhain, is the transition point between the, the bright side and the dark side. And uh, so there's an analogy there between the living and the dead, of course. So Halloween was perceived back in the olden days to be the best time to access the other world or communicate with the dead. Um, so the easiest time of the year to, access, to communicate with the other world is now, today, tonight, and tomorrow morning, that sort of thing. The easiest place to do that in Irish mythology is a place called Awinagat. Awinagat means the cave of the cats, and uh, it's in County Roscommon. This is Ireland. There's Awinagat just there. I actually come from just there, that dot there is where I come from, a place called Athlone. I mentioned it quite a few times in my talk because it's actually relevant towards the end of my talk. And I gave a talk in Athlone about a, few, about a month ago, which is sort of overlaps a bit with this. Anyway, there's a cave of the cats. So that's where Halloween comes from. That's, where, that's, that's, that's it. Um, that's the, the best time of year to access, the best time of year to access the other world and the best place to access the other world is here. Uh, there's all sorts of stories associated in, uh, with Awinagat in Irish mythology. And one I give you, um, it's, well, there's scary birds who do scary things and stuff like that. But this one I like, and it's of relevance to today, uh, pigs of magic came out of the cave at Halloween time, and people tried to count the pigs, but it's impossible. Well, it is possible. If I count these pigs, for example, I might count three pigs. But if you count them, you might count five pigs, and you might count seven pigs, and you might count 15 pigs. And nobody is right and nobody is wrong. We're all right, but we don't match. And that's the weird magic of the pigs. The reason for this is because around this Halloween time, Samhain time, uh, the laws of physics which apply to our world don't really apply on the far side, the other side. And um, so the fundamental laws of physics get a little bit distorted at Halloween time in Irish mythology. Um, so that's why it's hard to count the pigs. Uh, we get li lived in sort of a, this, uh, this um, you know, for the Alice in Wonderland type world where things are a little bit different. So the pigs, of course, are a product of agriculture and that's sort of, I'm trying to connect with this research center and stuff and with the earth. Can we count the pigs is the question. Um, it's sort of a little bit, like counting researchers, or let's say not counting researchers, but, but measuring the quality of research. There's some analogy there as well. How do we count? How do we measure the quality of science? So what we've just come from there is this idea of there's a transition between life and death. And this transition, in my interpretation of the world, we would call it a phase transition, which I'll talk about again shortly. There's a phase transition from this reality to a different one. And um, so to understand the pigs and Irish mythology, or mythology generally, you have to understand a little bit about phase transitions going to the far side. And to understand this, you will see also, you have to understand a little bit about phase transitions. Uh, so I'll talk about phase transitions, how one thing changes into something else. Okay, so here comes the phase transitions. So to, back to physics in the world that we live in now. So we're all very familiar with, for example, H2O. Again, water, I think, is in, your, in, your, in CAWR. So we have... Um, H2O can be in form of ice of, or water of steam, so it can be solid, liquid, or gas. And between these different phases, there are phase transitions. And that's the bread and butter of the sort of stuff that we do over in FCS in uh, the Faculty for Complex and uh, uh, flu Fluid uh, and Complex Systems Research Centre. Um, <clears throat> the universe itself, there's lots of phase transitions in the emergence of the universe. So back in the uh, start of the universe, there was no, for example, there's no mass. Things do not have mass at the start of the universe. And then, after a couple of seconds, mass just spontaneously emerges. And there's a mathematical theory around this, which is connected to the Higgs boson, which was very much in the news recently. Um, and uh, that sort of mathematics is very similar to the mathematics that we use to understand things like magnets. And this is really the bread and butter of the, of the things that we do over there in FCS, in theoretical physics. We look at magnets a lot, and that type of system. This is actually my fridge at home, our fridge. It's a mess. And, uh, but it works, you get things stuck to it, like lottery tickets and stuff. And um, so uh, it works because 
the magnets work. But the magnets only work at our room temperature now, or the, like a piece of iron, for example, can, is magne can be magnetized. But if you heat it up to a very high temperature above 770 degrees, then it's no longer magnetized. So before the iron melts, it's not, it, it loses its magnetic properties. And how it does that is a bit mysterious until you know how it, how it happens. And by the way, coming back, if we lived in a very high temperature world and we were to come back down into the low temperature world, then miraculously um, magnetization will just manifest itself, just the same way as the Higgs boson and all that sort of stuff goes on. Very, very similar mathematics. But in the Higgs boson case, it's more four dimensions um, that we're interested in. And, um, but we just simplify to understand. So I bring you back now to the Ising model. The next few slides will be about the Ising model. And um, the Ising model is the most famous generic fundamental model in the sort of stuff that we do over in um, the flu Fluid and Complex Systems Research Centre. Um, so before I talk about Ising himself, the first citation in Ising's thesis actually is to a guy called Richard Kerwin, who I'm connecting this with Ireland because I happen to be from Ireland. That's where I, I know what things go on there. And um, this guy, Richard Kerwin, he's pretty much not really known in the world of our statistical physics community nowadays. So one of my missions will be to get his name re-known again. Uh, he actually comes from here, County Galway. Again, I come from there, he comes from there. And he had the idea that magnets work because a, a system like this, like a piece of iron, is actually made up of magnetons. Like the, the, the magnet, when it's magnetized, it is a south pole and a north pole. And it, the, the idea is that it actually it's actually comprised lots of atoms themselves, and these also have their individual south poles and north poles. And when the, when the system is magnetized, then these are all aligned. And when it's not magnetized, they're not aligned. They're all higgledy-piggledy pointing all over the place. And on average, they're pointing nowhere. But this idea by itself is not enough. Something is missing. And the crucial thing that is missing is interactions between the magnetons. They have to interact with each other for, the system, for this to work, for this theory to work. And this idea came about approximately 100 years ago by uh, Wilhelm Lenz. Uh, Wilhelm Lenz was a very wise man who had this uh, had inspiration. And he had, was inspired to have this idea and gave the idea to his student who was very knowledgeable. So wisdom and knowledge is also something that will come through this talk. Um, he gave the idea to his PhD student. And the, the model is nowadays mostly named after the PhD student, um, Ernst Ising. So it's called the Ising model. Uh, sometimes it's called the Lenz Ising model. And um, Ising had the knowledge to be able to calculate some things around this model. And in particular, he wanted to look at it in one dimension. So he wanted to look not as a three-dimensional logic, which is far too hard to do calculations on, and two dimensions is even difficult, but in one dimension, he had to go at that, and which makes sort of sense. Simplify firstly. So the plan was, so here's a one-dimensional leasing model. So you've got spins, as we call them spins, they're actually like uh, atoms, and they have some little magnets themselves, or the magnetons. They have a south pole and north pole, so a direction. And the idea was that if the system is cold enough, this is a temperature axis, but it doesn't matter. If the system is cold enough, then they should be aligned. And if the system is warm enough, they should not be aligned. And that will make the, the system unmagnetized. So he was hoping for this and hoping to find a phase transition in this model, which he mathematically solved. And um, unfortunately, there is no phase transition in one dimension. So that was sad. And it made Ising still got awarded his PhD. It was still a great piece of work. And, um, but it was disappointing. And his um, supervisor, Lenz, was also disappointed. And they tended to just move away from that. And Ising himself suggested in his PhD thesis, or maybe it was his paper, that um, there's probably there's no phase transition in this mag model either. So it doesn't explain magnetism, unfortunately, in two dimensions or three dimensions either. That was his suggestion. So there's the one-dimensional Ising model. There's a bit of his thesis up there 100 years ago. But in the meantime, things have moved on, and people have looked in more detail at the two-dimensional model and the three-dimensional model of the Ising model. It's called the Ising model now. And in particular, the model was solved in two dimensions in 1944. It was hailed as the most important, most significant achievement in theoretical physics during the Second World War period. And um, uh, Onsega got a Nobel Prize later for something different, but he solved the model in two dimensions, and indeed there is a phase transition. So this is really good. So there is a phase transition looking something like that. So the system goes from being magnetized to not being magnetized. And um, the 3D, the three-dimensional model, three-dimensional leasing model to this day remains unsolved. So if anybody can solve that, that is Nobel Prize material. It's really difficult. Uh, somebody recently showed that it's what's called NP-complete. So it's too hard to solve. We can't do it. Um, but back in the day, as I say, Ising's negative solution, the the non-existence of phase transitions in the one dimension 
was, see, was seen a bit negatively. And even nowadays, there's some uh, negative remarks about Ising's contribution. Uh, Barry Sand, this guy is a, a famous math mathematical physicist. And in his book to 2014, he said things like, Ising's was an ele elementary calculation. I mean, now it's elementary. Students do it nowadays, third year students say, or fourth year students nowadays. But back then, it wasn't so elementary, I would say. And an erroneous conclusion, the conclusion being that there's no phase transition in three dimensions or two dimensions. And he says that history has its revenge because Ising's, people call Ising Ising nowadays because he moved to America. Um, things like that. Uh, an editor of Nature recently as well said it's, his result is trivial and um, it's spectacularly wrong. So these are sort of, I would, I find them a little bit unkind, these comments, and I don't particularly like unkind comments. I mean, there's no need for it. It was revolutionary at the time and he was on the right track. So we come back to that. But um, in the meantime, people have moved on and they've tried to, let's say, do things such as applying the Ising model to other systems, such as, for example, bankers. So the idea is here that bankers are like spins or like um, atoms in some way. They're interacting with each other and they behave in a way a little bit that can be described as by the Ising model. So here's something, so you can see it there. They're behaving like a magnet. So one banker thinks that the other banker knows more than he or she does and they start imitating each other just like the little magnets do. So you can describe bankers to some extent using the Ising model. Even the brain, um, there's a model called the Hupfield model, which is for, so the neurons in the brain have two states. They can either be firing or not firing, just like being uh, up or down in the Ising model. And there's a model developed around that. So the brain, I mentioned that because it's our perception of reality and um, our perception of reality when you go back to the, pig around, the pigs around Halloween time might be a little bit weird. I mentioned this one because this one came up, um, this example, uh, trees talking to their neighbours, say the newspapers, and there was a paper about an, a year and a half ago, which I uh, was astonished at really, to see that there was some easing model of trees. And the idea here is that these trees, um, there's th their, their upness or downness, or their, their south and north pole type thing, this binary thing, is whether they produce a good yield or a bad yield, the crops that they produce. And um, they're interacting with each other, and they call it talking there in the newspaper, but actually really the idea is that they're interacting through some fungus or something like this under the ground. So if one gets a disease, the other one gets a disease and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so they can be modelled using the Ising model incredibly. I, I just found that amazing when that came up about two years ago or a year and a half ago. So now our recent contribution to the Ising model, very recent, in fact just now, um, Let's look back at this one-dimensional Ising model, which Ising found there was no phase transition in. And so the, the reason why there's no phase transition in this model, and, and it was known for a very long time, is that there's too, there's too much entropy in the model and too little energy in the model. Entropy means there's too many configurations. It can be pointing in various directions, all higgly-piggly in too many ways. So to try and trigger a phase transition in this one-dimensional Ising model, we want, we'd have to remove the entropy. But to remove the entropy, how do we do that? Well, our way of doing it was firstly by adding more entropy into the system. So the, we go the wrong way, firstly, because it's easier to do. So we add what we call invisible states. These invisible states are atoms or something which are not, which they're not interacting and they have, they're, they're doing nothing. They're just extra configurations, but they're not actually adding to, adding, they're adding entropy to the system, but not add, adding energy to the system. And then we do this really magical thing we then add these invisible states and then we subtract them away again, except for we subtract away more than we add mathematically. So now we have a negative number of invisible states. So it's a mathematical construct, which is not physical, but it's a mathematical idea. With a negative number of invisible states, we call these negative number of invisible states ghost states, because today is Halloween. But actually we, we, we called it ghost states well before, like ages ago, independent of Halloween, but we call them ghost states. And then we can figure, trigger a phase transition in this model so if you put a few ghosts in the thing, it works in one dimension. And uh, so that means Ising and Lens were right all along. And uh, just all you have to do is plug in a few ghosts and, and the thing works even in 1D. So our, this is the student who did that, Petro um, Sarkanich. He received his PhD in two weeks' time. So I, it's a coach hotel between us and a uh, university in, 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 in um, Ukraine. And uh, that's his other PhD supervisor. So he, receives his, uh, he already had received an award for this in Ukraine. But anyway. Petro, so the question is, is this real, these ghost states, negative numbers of invisible states? Well, yes, actually, because he discovered that there's a duality relation, as we call it, between these ghost states and what's called a complex magnetic field, which is something to do with magnetic with imaginary numbers. But it doesn't matter about the details of these things. The point is that these uh, ghosts, these, these complex magnetic fields were recently realized, in 2015, in fact, by 
having this type of system, but you put in a little quantum probe on the thing. And a quantum probe is something that can be done. It can be done experimentally if you have a cold, small system. So that means these things can be actually experimentally realized, and that's something that hasn't been done in one dimension yet. Uh, so it's something that we can look at in the future. So that's, we've sort of, we ha well, we're not the first ones to rescue the Ising model in one dimension, but we have rescued the Ising model in one dimension using this funny system of ghost states. And another idea to um, look at, I actually was speaking with Julia and Barbara about this at some point, or the idea was to put, talk to them about this. Uh, to test these, to test this one, we could look at the same thing, trees, but not in two dimensions, in this two dimensional array, but instead in a one dimensional array. Now we can't put in ghost trees into the thing. It's going to be very difficult if we make an experiment with ghost-like trees. But what we can do is simply look at the thing in one dimension. And if we can do that, we can perhaps, <laughs> we should be able to see correlations between the trees which are different to the correlations in the two-dimensional system. And if that follows the using model in one dimension as well, then we can verify this paper. That's something, a project for the future that we could look at, one could look at. Anyway, let's come back. So the, I, I spoke about the opinion of Ising as trivial, and there was no citations to his paper for the first 15 years. At first, so, that's, so nothing was really happening. And the question arises, how good are scientists and how good is their work? And um, are the comments like this really OK or not? And as you can see, what I've done with the bankers and the trees and our one-dimensional ghost state Ising thing, lots of people are still working on Ising models and, and so on. So a massive effect. So are there any, uh, is this stuff any good? How do we measure the quality of science is the question that I'd like to address now. Well, as it happens, 90% of all scientists that ever lived are now alive. So it's a good time to start looking at them statistically. And um, uh, we, we can, of course, REF does that and we're all interested in REF. I guess you all know about, of course, REF and all that sort of stuff, sort of. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, okay, so the REF is imminent and um, then there's, um, scientometrics, like citation counts and stuff like that. And everybody is thinking about these things as well. So the question arises, uh, how do these things correlate with each other? That's one thing. Which way would we, we you, what would be the best way to use to measure the quality of science? Um, well, we started in a, our adventures into this scientometrics world a few years ago, actually around the time of, well, actually looking at the last, at the, the last RAE, the last research assessment exercise, 2008. The reason this is, this gives us good data because now, for the next ref, we've got, I think there's 34 different disciplines, but back in those days, there were 67 disciplines, so they were more finely grained. For example, applied mathematics was its own discipline, and Coventry University had submitted seven staff in applied mathematics back in 2008. Um, Oxford University, for example, submitted 54 staff in their last, in that, uh, in 2008. And this was the results of the RAE for applied mathematics nationwide. Um, this is quality, some measure of quality, it doesn't matter how I define it, just some measure of quality, and that's the institutions listed by name. On the left, Aberystwyth, on the right, something like Warwick, something like that, so alphabetically listed. That's the average quality. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge, as you'd expect, came up higher. Coventry came out lower. And um, so that's a little bit sad. And you look at that and you think, that's not so good. So what's going on? Uh, the idea was to look at this, not you use the same data now, but not um, quality versus alphabetical name, but quality versus the size of the submission. And you can see a very definite pattern here. So that plot looks very random, but this plot looks very structured. And it looks like something like a phase transition in here. If you're small, size matters. But if you're large, size doesn't matter so much. And that is exactly what we observe in all disciplines, or almost all disciplines. Here's physics, experimental physics, for example. It's the same thing, the same structure a sharp rise, and then it plateaus out. Um, so we built a mathematical around, model around that, and it was based on the concepts of the Ising model. So remember the Ising model, you've got these atoms and stuff, and they're all interacting. And in, with humans, we've got people, or let's say research centers, we've got people who are interacting, and the interactions are crucial in all of this. And our model that we built, which is like an Ising model, um, explains why this phase transition happens. And basically the gist of it is that if you have a research center, say of five or seven people, if you've got seven people in your research center, if you add one more person, that's going to make a massive difference. Because if you have seven people, if, I, if I'm in a group of seven, I can interact with six others. But if one more person joins, I can now interact with seven other people. And everybody else can too. So it makes a massive difference. But if I'm in a group of 100, say, and then I can't interact with 99 other people. So adding, I can only act with so many, say 20 or something or less. So adding another person doesn't help me, it just reconfigures things slightly. So that's why size doesn't matter here, but size does matter down here. And back in those days, um, 
after that, that RAE, I went to the then dean of the faculty and said, look, if we want to improve, we have to get bigger. And um, the dean agreed and gave us more staff. And this is how we performed at the last ref. So now this is the last ref. This was 2014. This was our performance. So again, this is the size. Again, you see the same pattern. The size is here, and this is the quality here, and that's Coventry Applied Mathematics. So we were fifth smallest out of 53 math submissions, but uh, we did 12th best in terms of the number of three-star and four-star papers. So already things were, uh, were improving, and now we're bigger again. And uh, so we just barely got to the critical mass the last time round, and now we're getting above the critical mass. So the question is, how are we going to do with the next ref? I mean, we're unlikely to shoot off up there, but if we can get to there, that'd be pretty good. And um, there's, there's the gang. And uh, so how are we going to now predict how we're going to do with the next ref, at this ref coming up now? Well, one way we could think about predicting our performance in ref is to look at scientometrics, look at the citation counts and that sort of thing. Um, actually, around the time of the last ref, 2014, there was enormous pressure to replace me uh, ref itself by metrics. That pressure was coming from the government with the idea that it would save money because ref is very expensive. It would save time, because it takes a lot of time to formulate a ref submissions and so on. And of course, it would put more control in the hands of the managers, and they would love that. They would just press a button, and then you know what to do. And uh, you don't have to think too much about it. So that would be great. And uh, um, people were suggesting this. And so we had a look at this. We investigated to see if you can replace ref by scientometrics. And we found, actually, the correlations are very poor. So this is, uh, we we, on the basis, this is some scientometrics, and this is peer review, the results of ref. And you can see that the correlations are not so good. Um, I said before that size matters, especially when you're small. These are, I didn't explain why, how we categorize these into small, medium, large research centers, but we can do that. And really, if you're small, it's completely you can, you're unpredictable. You cannot predict ref on the basis of metrics. If you get bigger, then maybe you can a little bit, but not really. Uh, the correlations are not good. And we predicted nationwide for all subject areas the results of ref before the last ref on the basis of citation counts. We knew our predictions would not, be, would not work out because we did not expect that there's going to be a good correlation. And so we predicted, for, to make impact, we predicted the results of ref before the last ref. And then after the last ref, when the ref results came out, we looked at our predictions to see how well they did. And they did not do good. In fact, one of the newspapers was quoting from me that um, you'd be as well off tossing a dice than trying to rely on metrics to predict ref. So that made a huge amount of impact, and um, I mean now impact in the ref sense, because uh, just after our paper, uh, the government, of course, was asking for, to replace ref by metrics. They commissioned a report, and a report came out called the Metrics Tide Report. The Metrics Tide Report, you might have heard of if you're involved in ref, that very heavily cites us and, and quotes us. We are saying don't use metrics to predict ref, to do ref. Don't replace ref by metrics. And Metrics Tide says the same thing and very heavily quotes us. Then the government said, well, let's check because they really wanted these metrics to be used. So they got another report commissioned called the Stern Report, and that comes to the same conclusion. So these guys cite these guys, and these guys cite us. And uh, so we had a little inter external review recently for in anticipation of the next ref, and uh, the external said we had massive impact on the UK. So we have helped halt the metrics tide. There's um, King Canute trying to halt the tide as well. So the conclusion from this point now is that um, metrics do not predict ref. And uh, in other words, metrics do not predict peer review. And it gets worse the smaller you are, the smaller the group is. So, but then the question is, when I talk about this, I'm talking about it as if ref is the be all and end all of everything. And we're trying to replicate ref using the scientometrics. But is ref the be all and end all of everything? What is ref itself? How can we predict ref using even peer review? Remember the pigs how hard it is to count them, especially at this time of year in that particular place, Avon Agat. And remember um, Easing himself, where he was uh, poorly received at some point, and even more recently. So the question is, how can we measure science when it's not a fundamental law? I mean, there are fundamental laws of physics, of course, but this is not fundamental laws of physics. We're talking about human opinion, about other human, human behavior, or stuff like that. So is the glass half full, or is the glass half empty, sort of stuff? Um, well, we did a little experiment inside Coventry University in 2015, where there was, uh, people were invited to, the entire university was invited to submit grant proposals, and bids for up to, you could ask for 10,000 pounds. 
there were 44 bids inside the university and there was a panel of assessors, there was 11 on the panel. So we can see there immediately the, the similarity with REF. So I was one of those 11 people on, this, on the panel of assessors. And the idea was that I, there's no way I'm going to assess 44 bids, I've got other things to do, but I can assess five. And that's what I did and that's what everybody did, five or four or three or whatever you felt like you could do, with some overlap so that everybody, not, not one, you don't have one person assessing a bid, but you've got at least two people assessing bids. And the idea is then that these people will discuss at a meeting and calibrate against each other and come to some agreement, that sort of thing. In reality, the meeting was two hours long. Everybody was hot, sticky, sweaty and horrible and wanted to get out. And <laughs> there's no way you can have this discussion about all these papers with all these submissions amongst all these people in, in a realistic way. So in the end, basically just the averages were taken and everybody thought, okay, that's fine, let's just do it. Let's agree and let's move on with our lives. And that's really how it worked. Um, but anyway, that was the process, and this is what happened. So there was, as I say, 44 bids. These are, we call them objects, with a paper about this. So 44 objects, or bids. Object number 41, sorry. Object number 41 was awarded 87% on average, and that was the highest, as in, as the same thing with object number 43. These are the, the ones that were successful, and there's loads more down there that were not successful. So that's how it worked, but there are flaws, obvious flaws in the system. For example, one of the flaws is stringency. This is the panel of assessors inside Coventry University. So I'm one of these people and um, I have to anonymize them, obviously. I'm the only one who, I will only declare my own identity in this, nobody else's. So if you're on the panel, you're safe. Um, but that's the panel, basically. And there's different degrees of stringency in the panel. So for example, if you look at, I give them names, like Sleepy was the most generous and um, Sleepy gave an average mark of 84%. Uh, the most least generous, was a person who identify as Meany. Meany gave an average mark of 49%. So you could have been lucky, and you could, if, you, if you were submitting your proposal, you might have got lucky and been assessed by Sleepy and Clumsy, and that would have been good. You might have got unlucky and been assessed by Meany and Grumpy. That could have happened. <laughs> and uh, so clearly we need to calibrate the assessors. And um, another thing is the confidence of the assessors. Their confidence in themselves or our confidence in them. So this person is, very confident, and this person is not so confident. So how do we assess confidence? How do we calibrate for confidences as well? Um, we have a way method to do that. Beautiful, beautiful algorithm, actually invented by this chap here, Robert Mackay, who's from Warwick University. He's the head of all sorts of things in mathematics and a very famous um, mathematician nationally and internationally. He was the head of the IMA, the Institute of, National, Institute of Mathematics and its Applications in the UK until recently. He was on the panel of the last two refs and um, he saw that, he observed there that this calibration system is not so good. And, th and that's why he came up with this idea that we need to calibrate properly. Um, he, because we had previously been doing things like predicting REF, he sort of liked that and got in contact with me. I got in contact with Rob Lowe, who's my colleague, uh, friend down in FCS, who seems to know everything about mathematics and a fantastic guy for calculating things. And um, Sarah is a student of um, Robert Mackay. And we all got together anyway, and we did something around this. Um, Mackay developed the algorithm. Again, the idea is there's a network and there has to be some sort of an overlap. So these are all assessors and they're linked if they assess the same object, the same grant bid. And we can calibrate them individually against each other. So it's not good enough if I go back there, for example, for example, Meany's score was 16% six, below the average of all the, all the averages and Sleepy was 18% above. So it's not good enough to subtract 18 from all of uh, Sleepy's marks or to add that number to all of Meany's marks, that wouldn't be good enough. Because it could have been that Meany might have just happened to get bad ones, yes, exactly. And that's what this algorithm developed by Robert Mackay, which we call Calibrate with Confidence, that's what that deals with. And the idea is that we want, ultimately, in the future, REF to use this algorithm. And um, that would be great. So the idea is that this algorithm will compensate for luck. So for example, object number 18 was successful, but object number 18 was assessed by Tiny and Clumsy in real life. This is real data in real life. So that successful one was assessed by these two and got lucky. Um, another one is object number 39, which was assessed by, uh, well, that was, that's, well, 25 was assessed by these two, not quite meaning, but nearly, and got very, very unlucky. And then confidence as well is a thing that plays a role. So if we take the data that we use at Coventry University to, for these bids, for these things, and put them through calibrate with confidence algorithm, we get a very different picture at the other side. 
So the yellow ones are the ones that were successful in the existing system. The green ones are the ones that, w sorry, the blue ones are the ones that would have been successful if they had been correctly correlated. And the green ones are the ones which would have been successful under both systems. So um, t they were taking Lady Luck out of the equation. And uh, six, only six would have survived. So the consequences, the knock-on effects are enormous. So for example, this bid, that person who submitted that bid, it could have been any of us, and that person submitted that bid, it was a very good bid, but they were unlucky. And that person, the way, that person went away that day feeling sad and maybe never carried out that research, which would have been good research. On the other hand, I'd love, I'd love to follow up and see what happened with this one, for example. Um, so you can see that it's not just about the people or the 10,000 uh, pounds. It's about everything, all the knock-on effects are pretty much enormous for the university and for all universities and everybody everywhere. So the conclusions so far are that Metrics cannot replace peer review. Um, we impacted on metrics tide, impacted on the Stern report, impacted on the format of REF itself. So this is the sequence that, made, that caused the lack of usage of metrics in this REF coming up now. So we contributed, not the only ones, but, but we did contribute a lot to that. Um, we need to calibrate. Uh, mock REFs, um, by, you can immediately infer that if you just rely on one or two opinions, you're in danger. I mean, if you had a mock ref in somewhere and you just happen to get assessed by these two people, then you know, things can... I mean, individual opinion is like counting these pigs in the mythological world of Awi Nagat. Um, these are the basis, of course, for, for research centres closing down, not just here, but everywhere. And um, so you have to be very careful, I would say. Calibrate correctly is the message so far. Calibrate correctly. I'm just checking the time. We're okay. So what about us? Yeah, the, the question is, could, could you have been metricized and under threat, let's say? Could we have been metricized and under threat in our research centre? Could have happened, of course. But actually, we, our papers have been externally reviewed and all that sort of stuff, and we're fine, and our papers are very, very good. But that's not enough, because we need more than that. Because papers only count for 60% of REF nowadays, and um, impact counts for 25%. So what about impact? Well, the stuff that I've just told you about is the basis of one of our impact case studies. It's not the only thing, but it's, it's a, a, around that. And in our research centre, we've got 19 staff to be submitted at the ZEXREF. We need two impact case studies. So what about, and by the way, I should say, for a group of, of like us, of 19 staff, one case study, one impact case study for REF is the equivalent of 20 outputs, 20 papers. So what about our other impact case study? Well, that's what I want to tell you a little bit about now for the remainder of my talk. Um, so firstly, I say that everything that we do research-wise is entirely and totally motivated by curiosity. I just have a big question mark there representing curiosity. So it's, it's not at all strategic, but I present it semi-strategic here because it's, it's a, we, we know now with hindsight. Um, the Stern report also that I mentioned earlier, it said that um, underdisciplinary papers were well represented, were a lot of the impact coming from, at the last ref, a lot of the impact came from interdisciplinary papers, but not so many papers, interdisciplinary papers were submitted themselves as outputs. So interdisciplinarity is underrepresented in terms of outputs because of the siloed structure of research centres. And um, then, uh, and, and a perception that interdisciplinary might be downgraded because it's very hard to assess. It's even harder to assess. Who do you say to submit a paper about the stuff I'm going to tell you shortly, for example, like where does it go to a physics panel and a, 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 a mythology panel or what? Anyway, um, but interdisciplinary is worldwide on the rise, and um, so let's look at interdisciplinary. This is the various research, various research themes and um, disciplines. So, maths and physics is here, for example, and uh, earth sciences are here, for example, biology. So, maths and physics will be closest to chemistry, and very, very far away is humanities. Seems very far away. But it's sort of very far away if you go this route. But if you have what we call per periodic boundary conditions here, and this thing overlaps like that, then actually ma mathematics is quite close to humanities. It's to do with the question of, is our world, is mathematics, does it underlie the, our physical existence, or is it our interpretation of the physical existence? That sort of thing. Anyway, um, remember now back Richard Kerwin, the guy from Galway, not too far away from where I come from, he, was, he published in mineralogy, geology, and all sorts of uh, hard sciences stuff, as they're called. But actually, he also did comparative mythology. And I was very delighted and shocked to discover this, because I myself do comparative mythology. I thought I was the only one crazy enough to go from physics to comparative mythology. But he did it 200 years before me. But they did say later that it might have been a product of his old age and you know, that sort of thing. So it could be happening to me too, God knows. 
But anyway, I have, this is the sort of thing that we do, how we get from physics to mythology. So here's an old text. What we do is we have, we get to take lots of old ancient texts, manuscripts are like epics and stuff. And in them, there are lots of characters and they're interacting. And these characters are interacting just like the atoms are interacting or like society is interacting. And we can analyze these mathematically. And when we started on this venture into the weird, for us, world of mythology, uh, we started off with the obvious low-hanging fruit. And for example, Icelandic sagas are very famous. The Iliad is very famous in Greek mythology. Beowulf, because we live in England. Uh, and Tom Bokulia is an Irish one, I, because I'm Irish. And so we looked at all these things and we're able to look at their networks and we're able to quantify them and compare them to each other, sort of measure their complexity and put numbers on them in a way that makes sense. So that just shows we did something, but um, we did something and this unique marriage of maths and myths led to all sorts of impact on the media. Um, so, and even this is our first paper on the subject, which has been downloaded loads and loads of times. It's the most downloaded paper in Europe, the best European physics journal and it's birth mythology in a physics journal. We, we had a book and then a series of books came out, out of that, not by us, by, by other people, called Simulating the Past. This is our paper on Icelandic mythologies on the front page of Physics World magazine, which is the magazine for the physics community in Britain. So it's mythology in the, on the front page of a physics newspaper sort of thing. And we had lots of impact in, on, in these places um, in the media. But then the question is, is impact in the media impact? That's the question, <laughs> because usually, especially in our world that we live in over there in FCS, it's we're embedded in the Faculty of Engineering and stuff. For them, impact is mostly an, a change in industrial processes. Uh, now, I would argue that if you have, if you're on TV or on radio and talking about mythology and, ma and maths and stuff, then it is impact because you're changing. People are looking at you. It could be millions of people, and their neurons in their brains are being reconfigured, like we had earlier. So that's impact, just the same way as a physical process in industry would be uh, in impact. But there was some resistance to this in um, uh, various quarters, let's say, of the university, where they don't think that media impact is impact. They're wrong, we're right, I guarantee it. But <laughs> anyway, um, let me now tell you, we're near the end, uh, so don't worry. Um, but I want to tell you a little story about one of the uh, things that we pursued a few years ago. But I think 20, 2000, 2016 we, we looked at this. This is the epic poems of Ossian. Um, the background is this. So in 1746, there was the famous Battle of Culloden, where the, it was the final showdown between the Scottish and the English, and the Scottish lost. And that was the end of Scottish independence, and Scotland got absorbed into the British Empire, and that was that. Of course, now there's hopes for new independence of Scotland, but that's the way it was then, in a way. So everybody was very despondent and very downcast in Scotland. And then there emerged a few years later a guy called James Macpherson. He came down from the mountains, from the highlands, and he just came down with this, what he called fragments of ancient poetry, which he claimed were translated from the original Scottish language called Gaelic into English. And this was beautiful. It had a new style of poetry. It was rhythmic prose and sparse diction. And the idea that you have of Scotland of being mystical and, um, uh, you know, like mists and that sort of stuff, that, that comes from this. And um, it was so successful, he went back up the mountains and he looked for more epics from, from this. It was supposed to be written by a Scottish bard from the third century, a guy called Ossian, third century. And um, he came back down and the world was really happy and rejoiced. So people in literature, Blake, Byron, Coleridge and also, and he really strongly impacted on them. They began to write their stuff as if it was mystical and stuff. And um, in music, Brahms, Mendelssohn, they were all inspired. Thomas Jefferson said Ossian was the, Ossian, this third century bard, was the greatest poet that ever existed. And Napoleon took a copy of these po poems with him on his campaigns. So people immediately thought, this is fantastic. And, and they thought these massive epics from Scotland are very similar to the classics in their beauty and complexity and so on. And they called Ossian, the third century Scottish bard, uh, the Homer of the North, for example. But not everybody was happy. And in England, they weren't so happy, or some people weren't happy. In particular, Samuel Johnson, who you know from the, he's the guy who invented the, uh, the what do you call the thing, the dictionary. And um, he said there was a strong temptation to deceit. So he was suspicious, but his suspicion was suspected as well because he viewed the Scottish as, and Gaelic, the language as the, view, the, the rude speech of a barbarous people. Um, now, during that time, during the imperial era, era, the British scholars and administrators, they, they sort of aligned themselves towards the classics. They had this idea that if you were educated and if you were civilized, then you had to know the classics. I mean, 
we know some people nowadays who are very much like the Catechists as well, in, uh, who consider themselves very, very civilised. And of course, it is good to know these things, but, you, but it's not just the classics. And um, they thought that they themselves carried the th torch of civilization down from the Romans, the, Greek, or the Greeks, the Romans, the British, that's the way it went. And that gave them just, they justified them somehow to invade Scotland and absorb Scotland into the British Empire because they were civilizing them and doing them a favor in a sense. Um, so this was, so if Scotland actually had these epic poems and a civilization as complex as that from Rome or Greece, then they had a right to exist as, a, as their own country. So it was a, a battle between Scotland and England, between Romanticism and Classicism, between Nationalism and imper Imperialism, a big, big, big controversy. And that was the, re the reaction in England, but the reaction in Ireland was even worse because Irish people immediately saw these poems of Ossian as corruptions from Irish mythology. They saw that this is, the characters were all basically all coming from Irish mythology, but all distorted in some way, like what happens around Halloween. Everything was sort of there, but wrong. And um, so Ossian, the illiterate bard of the illiterate age from the, thir the third century Scottish bard was actually Ushin. Every school child in Ireland knows about Ushin, a famous um, character for a warrior poet of the Fenian cycle of Irish mythology. Fingal, Ossian's father, is Finn McCool in Irish mythology. So you could immediately identify these, these, these characters. Um, so I Ireland was furious because they thought their culture and their identity was being misappropriated. And um, so the question is, is Ossian the Homer of the North? Is he this uh, really, really, something real about it or does it, is it more akin to Irish mythology, the stories that have come out of this thing? So we looked at Ossian, the, these massive epics, we looked at the Iliad and the Odyssey and the, class, the, the classics and we also looked at Irish mythology and the upshot of it is without any, all you need to do is see the, the patterns, the patterns are here. The Ossianic stuff, this, the stuff from Macpherson from Scotland um, are red and the classics are blue, Iliad and the Odyssey. So the red is not like the blue, that means it's not like the, the, and the green is the Irish stuff and the red is like the Irish stuff. So our network analysis shows, I mean, people know this from humanities anyway, but they don't know it in terms of networks. They know that this, that this stuff was very strongly connected to Irish mythology. And we can see that in our quantitative mathematical network science approach. And this stuff also led to lots of media impact. But then of course, is this impact at all uh, for REF? So and now I come to the last stage recently, very recent, that in the last few months something has happened that makes it a sort of a moot point um, because we, just a little story about how the unpredictable things happen in our crazy world. Um, this is where I come from, the town I mentioned before, Athlone, and uh, in that, through that town flows a river called the Shannon, the Shannon River, so that's what my hometown looks like and I was home there one time, saw the newspaper, the local newspaper, and um, there was a, the, the, the local council wanted to put up a statue in the town to represent the town. And they had a competition amongst artists and sculptors and so on. And they shortlisted it down to three pieces. These are the three pieces that were shortlisted. So the statue should represent the town in some way and um, should represent the river. Uh, and in if it, so you see, um, it should represent the, the heritage of the town, the river, the river Shannon going through the town and so on. And they asked the people, the people's vote would not count, but the people had the right to give their opinions if they wanted. And that's basically the information they gave them. And these were the three pieces that were shortlisted. So just out of curiosity, what would you vote for, given that information that you have now? If you want to, something to represent your town. Okay, who goes for number one? Put your hand. Who goes for number two? And who goes for number three? Okay, then sort of a, okay. So not everybody voted, but the majority go for number two, and that's exactly what happened. That piece was selected. Number two was selected. It's supposed to represent a deity of the river, the river god, harking back to Irish mythology and that sort of thing. But this is what made me annoyed when I came home and saw this thing and, um, in the newspaper and that's supposed to represent my hometown. So I was not happy because this actually comes from Dublin, firstly, um, and it comes from an era which is uh, the colonial times um, where these, there's a place called the Custom House in Dublin. There are lots of rivers there. They all represent uh, various rivers of Ireland. They represent the taking of the products of the land via the rivers to Dublin to be exported to the British Empire back in those days, 250 years ago or thereabouts. And uh, they were built by people who had come from, from a very privileged nobility background, very, very disconnected to the ordinary people. All of these river gods, except one, they're all male. But in Irish mythology, the river gods are female. They're goddesses, they're not male. So these things have nothing to do with um, Irish mythology, really. Um, 
The people who built that, when people protested back in those days, they said that the impoverished underclass should be kept down with a policy of unyielding repression. So my horror is that, these, that this is supposed to represent the town. Um, so, so that's why I don't like it. I don't like this. So I wrote a letter to the local newspaper, and I know about this stuff because we did our work on Ossian, where we had a very, very similar thing, where you have Irish mythology, and I'd attempt to replace it by something that's a bit neoclassical. Under the misguided belief that neoclassical is sophisticated and educated and everything is okay with it. So let's ignore Irish mythology and write it, overwrite it and put this concocted thing instead. So I said, no, this is not right. If you look back at Irish mythology, the river is named, the river has a goddess, not a god. Her name, the, riv, the name of the river Shannon comes from Shanuna. Shan in Irish nowadays even means old. This means an old goddess, an ancient goddess. She comes from a sort of a mythological, well, a, um, uh, people called the two of the Donnan, a mystical race. Um, she's described in Irish narratives as radiant, ever generous, strong, gentle lady of noble repute, sweet voiced, red lipped. She has a personality, is the point. This guy does not have a personality, he's just that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like it. There's a story around her, and it's a beautiful story. It really connects with this talk because in Irish mythology, the hazel trees are trees of wisdom. Uh, the, the, the hazelnuts fall from the trees and they fall into the water and the salmon eat them. And these become salmon which are, which are knowledge is associated with the salmon. If you eat the salmon, you get knowledge. And um, see, she, she wanted to go to this well called Connell's Well, and um, she wanted to, she, what she was after in that well was knowledge. It was actually something, it was like poetic wisdom she was looking for, something that's uh, sort of, some high up knowledge or wisdom that she wanted. Um, it ended up with her drowning in the river and uh, that's why the river is named after her. And um, the story foretells the shadow of the danger of knowledge, uh, knowledge in the wrong hands. A little, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, is the moral of the story. Absolute knowledge was believed to be perilous when handled incorrectly. Now you see where I'm coming with the metrics. I mean, you, you might know something, but you have to know the context to put it in the right place. And um, so anyway, that was my letter in the local newspaper where I connected it with um, our work saying that it's understandable that the council didn't understand this because they don't know about Ossian and the history of this stuff. But I tell you now, so stop. And then somebody invited me on the radio and then other people were, took, took this up and got, um, you know, wanted to stop this statue going up. And other people were on the radio. A petition was formed and um, people wanted to stop this. This was only last July, August, September, like now. And um, many letters in the local newspaper, protests. This is um, an event where people ha and their, brought their children and they have their maths books and their myths books to show that this is connected with maths and myths, myths and maths. And they want knowledge. They don't want to be misinformed. Like um, people would say that people are misinformed about Brexit, that there was a, a vote happened like this vote happened. Uh, many, many events took place and um, more letters to the newspaper, even something in the, in the national newspaper, there was a quiz, how well do we know our own statues in Ireland? Things like that. We're on, somebody was on the TV, this is TG Cahar, it's a national TV station, and that sort of thing. So when, I was in, so when I was in my hometown recently, I gave a talk, some overlap with this talk, and at the end of the talk I asked, well now, who do you want to be? Who do you want to represent you? If I ask you to vote again, I mean, this one, that's the size of the statue, by the way, that's going up. And that's our original mythology. So that's, that would be the informed choice if one has a choice again. But the people don't have another choice because the council are not going back. Um, so the moral of the story is this. This is now my last, sort of my last slide. Citations don't predict ref. Um, peer review is like counting magical pigs. It's, you've got to be, it's not like the fundamental laws of physics. It's, it's to do with individual opinions and they have to be rightly, correctly calibrated. Um, our pursuit of, of curiosity delivers unpredictable impact. So just do whatever you want in, a, in an academic environment. Um, uh, Shunan's, the, the moral of her story is knowledge in the wrong hands can be perilous, can be dangerous. So that's basically the end of my talk, or sort of maybe not, because in the meantime, it is actually the end, don't worry. But uh, in the meantime, this is the Irish passport. It's actually the passport sent to us by one of the councillors. And um, you can see this little character creeping in there in the passport. So incredibly, he's, he's getting around. And um, 
So it's not quite over yet. That's my daughter's picture, by the way, because <laughs> it's Halloween. So uh, that's, the, um, that's the next thing we've got to do. Get this, uh, draw attention nationally to this, to this uh, thing. By the way, just one final comment. 20 years ago, I would have given the talk, it would have looked like this. <laughs> but now uh, I give talks where there's no equations, and these are the guys with the knowledge, the PhD students who have done this work. And uh, they know everything, they know all the things, and I just pull it all together. So that's basically it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I went over time. <laughs>